Today, I'll be discussing with my guest a fascinating but admittedly broad subject. That is the Protestant Reformation in its many shapes and forms and its strengths and weaknesses from an Eastern Orthodox Christian perspective. And my guest is Father Josiah Trenum, Senior Pastor of St. Andrew Orthodox Church in Riverside, California, and the author of the new and, in my opinion, groundbreaking new book, Rock and Sand, an Orthodox appraisal of the Protestant Reformers and their teachings, published by New Rome Press and available on Amazon.com. Father Josiah, welcome and congratulations on a meticulously researched, documented, and well-written book. Thanks a lot, Kevin. I'm happy to be with you today. Very much enjoying the book and uh, recommend it to both Protestants as well as Orthodox who want to know more about the Protestant Reformation and how we understand its many shapes and forms. First, Father, I think our listeners and viewers would be interested in some personal background. You come from a Reformed Calvinist tradition, don't you? It's true. It's true, though I am an Orthodox Christian. Now, I wasn't born and raised as an Orthodox Christian. I was born and raised as a Presbyterian in Southern California. That is my background. And I understand that you studied with some pretty heavy Reformed heavyweights. Uh, with that's, that's true. Most of my, all of my formal education has been a, a Protestant education. I went to an evangelical undergraduate school uh, called Westmont College, a very beautiful college up in Santa Barbara, which is associated with the evangelical tradition. Uh, I did my Master's of Divinity at a Calvinist reform school, uh, graduating from Westminster Theological Seminary. And then I did my doctoral degree at a Church of England school, the University of Durham in Northern England. So I've uh, been educated by the cream of the crop of uh, Protestantism. Who are some of the Reformed uh, teachers that maybe some would, uh, would know about uh, that, whom, whom you studied under? Well, I, I consider myself very blessed to have studied under some really talented Reformed minds. People like Dr. R.C. Sproul. Very well known. He's very well known. A fantastic communicator. He was my systematic theology professor. Uh, Dr. J.I. Packer, uh, Dr. Sinclair Ferguson, John Gerstner, Roger Nicole, Richard Pratt, uh, and the great, uh, immensely intelligent uh, John Frame, who in my opinion is perhaps the, uh, the most competent uh, Protestant Reformed theologian alive today. Hmm. So a, a logical follow-up that some of our listeners and uh, viewers are going to be interested in knowing, Father Josiah Trenum, is with all that background, what are the key reasons you decided to leave the mm -hmm. Protestant tradition and become Eastern Orthodox and pursue the priesthood? Mm. Well, uh, I should say just off the cuff, Kevin, that uh, my, my leaving and becoming Orthodox was not something that, that I did in passion. It wasn't something that I did because I had been offended by my Protestant uh, teachers. In fact, uh, I keep a deep reverence for many of them, and I have received so much light and so much instruction from many of them uh, that I, I'm continually thankful for them. What happened to me really was that uh, I, I would say two things drove me to Holy Orthodoxy. Uh, one was a, a deep sense that my tradition in which I had been raised was unstable, uh, that the winds of the secular culture were blowing very hard and the church was not standing firm. Uh, there were a few definitive moments in which my eyes were open to this. Um, I remember once one of my professors uh, telling me that uh, our traditional conservative reformed church probably would have women ministers within 25 years. And, and this was a man I deeply revered, uh, a tremendous pedagogue. And I remember being crushed by that because I knew it to be true. Uh, I had seen it in the denomination in which I was raised, the Presbyterian Church USA. I was now in a more conservative reform movement. And here he was telling me that that was going to happen there also. Um, that sense that the, the Protestant Reformed movement and evangelicalism in general did not have a stake, an unmovable stake for the faith that was competent to resist the blowing of the winds of unbelief in our own culture deeply affected me. And I was very impressed by Holy Orthodoxy, which has a 2,000 year track record of resisting um, the opposition of the world. Uh, this was very, very impressive to me. I remember telling my wife, we were married very young, and I remember telling her 
sweetheart, I can't imagine investing my life in a church and raising my children in that church, knowing that my children will not have that church when they become adults. Mm. That, in fact, all of this investment will be for naught. Uh, that deeply affected me. And I would say a, a second, uh, while that was happening, I was reading the patristic writers. And the more I did that, the more I felt the deep weight, the depth of, uh, of Orthodox theology uh, and the breadth, which is, which is far broader than, than the Reformed tradition. Um, and I began to visit Orthodox churches. And I would say this was the final uh, the final grip that where God just grabbed us and pulled us into the church was that uh, the worship of, of Holy Orthodoxy is so profound, so sublime, to worship the Holy Trinity uh, with awe and reverence, uh, as I knew it should be from reading the texts of Scripture, but was not my experience in the Reformed tradition. Mm -hmm. To find that in Orthodox worship, this was irresistible. Hmm. Thank you. Great answer. Turning to your book, Father Josiah Trenum, what does the title of your book, Rock and Sand, mean to convey as it relates to the Protestant movements and churches and non-denominational groups and the Orthodox Church? Rock and Sand, uh, these are words taken from our Savior's teaching uh, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Kevin, where he uh, speaks about the coming judgment and the floods that will certainly come uh, on the great day in the future. And he calls his disciples to build their life upon the rock of obedience to his commandments as the only way to survive the great earthquake which is coming in the great judgment. Uh, he talks about a house that's built on the rock and a house that's built on the sand. One survives the flood, one does not. Uh, I use that image uh, it, to convey what I sense to be the difference between Orthodoxy, which is the church built upon the commandments of Christ, not on the opinions of men, even intelligent men like the Protestant reformers. The, the Orthodox Church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, is built upon the faith that Christ gave through his apostles. And uh, forgive me, but I believe with all the good intentions of the Protestant reformers, the churches that they ended up, end up setting up in their own name, uh, much against their wishes initially, um, is a church that doesn't have the promise of Christ attached to it, that he will preserve it against the gates of hell, and that he will lead it into all the truth. I think that the Protestant churches were um, man-made. Hmm. But as an ex-Protestant, and one who obviously has great respect for many of its uh, participants and brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you see as enduring virtues or any positive accomplishments of the Protestant Reformation before we get into anything critical? Well, I would say there are many, Kevin. In fact, um, in my own life, I have many beautiful Christian souls who are Protestant uh, in faith, who in many ways I look at as being more Orthodox than me. Uh, they're living off of the capital of the Orthodox Church, what I would call borrowed capital. Uh, they don't know, for instance, that their New Testament it could not exist without the Orthodox Church, that the canon of Scripture was put together by Orthodox bishops, uh, and that it was not an easily accomplished task. Uh, and yet they love that Scripture better than I often do, and better than many Orthodox Christians often do. Mm -hmm. And so they actually are living more Orthodox lives in this area than, than we Orthodox Christians often do. I think the devotion to Scripture in much of the Protestant movement, the devotion to education, the devotion to missions, uh, the devotion to cultural engagement, at least in contemporary Protestantism. I think all of these areas are areas that Orthodox Christians uh, could learn to appropriate their own tradition from those who are not in their tradition but are living the tradition better than we are. Hmm. You know, moving towards the Reformation and our conversation today, Father Josiah Trenum, you know, I hear from some Orthodox Christians that they're often negative about the Reformation because of, you know, the many changes from apostolic Christianity which have taken place. We'll talk about some of those. But what were the Reformers supposed to do, mm -hmm. given some of the errors of the Latin Church, some of which we also broke from in 1054 AD? What were they supposed to do if not break from the, uh, from the uh, Latin Church? You raise a, a tremendous question, and, and very insightful, I think, and we should be cautious 
in placing judgments upon the Protestant reformers as though uh, they had the, uh, the benefit of hindsight after 500 years that we have. Looking back on their condition, uh, it's easy for us to say, well, why didn't they do this and why didn't they do that? But the options that they themselves felt that they had at the time uh, perhaps were more limited than, than we think. For instance, let's take Martin Luther. Uh, Luther was a Catholic priest monk. And he knew, he was deeply affected by the novelties that had arisen in the Latin Church during the scholastic period. So this is after they had left Orthodoxy, after the Great Schism had taken place between the East and the West. And numerous Latin councils had been held local, what we would consider the local Latin councils, uh, supporting practices that are abhor abhorrent to Orthodox, such as um, the real uh, externalization of concepts of salvation, the idea of indulgences and selling indulgences, which I'm hoping we'll, we'll talk about more, these things provoked uh, tremendous pain in Martin Luther's life. And initially, when he was uh, raising uh, academic <clears throat> controversy and, and trying to stir up dialogue on these subjects, he appealed to us. He appealed. He said, I, I stand with the Greeks, he said. Um, and he was trying to point out that this was... Um, an innovation on the part of the papacy, and that this isn't something that even the Orthodox knew. And he had a very good point there. Uh, that interest in us, uh, which also was, was, I would say, even more alive in his confidant, Philip Melanchthon, uh, who actually wrote to the ecumenical patriarch, and the ecumenical patriarch, this was Joseph, this is in the 16th century, dispatched uh, a deacon, Deacon Misos was his name, who came and lived for six months with Melanchthon, helped him translate the Augsburg Confession into Greek, and really gave him an experience of what was going on with us. That initial contact between uh, the Lutheran movement and Orthodoxy, I think from the Orthodox perspective, is the, the direction that Orthodox, if we could look back and wish something else had happened, mm -hmm. that that would have been developed more. <clears throat> now remember, we're dealing with uh, the great church in captivity under the Ottomans. Right. Uh, lots of difficulty. Our patriarchs <clears throat> were very confined. Plus, we're talking uh, pre-technological age. We couldn't call each other on the phone. One letter from the Lutheran theologians took six months just to get to Constantinople. If the patriarch waited for a year to answer it or studied his, uh, his answers and said it, we're talking two years for one simple exchange. Right. Uh, so that's the area, we, I think, the direction we would have hoped it would have went. Uh, I think that is initially the direction that Martin Luther wanted it to go. He was aghast that his followers were calling themselves Lutherans. Uh, but that is exactly what ended up mm. happening, is churches built upon personalities, mm. and instead of returning to the root of the tree, uh, because a Latin aberrant mm. branch had grown, what we ended up getting was uh, many, many more aberrant branches. Mm. And I'd like to follow up on that a little bit later about the <clears throat> dialogue between the Lutherans mm. and uh, the ecumenical patriarch at that time. Uh, the first principle of the Reformation, Father Josiah Trenum, you know, universally embraced by the main branches of all Protestantism, as you point out in your book, is sola scriptura, or by scripture alone. And that's a doctrine that the Bible alone is the only infallible source or rule of faith and practice, and that the Bible alone contains everything necessary for salvation. Now, you call this teaching uh, a heresy from which the other Protestant mistakes and errors and heresies flow. And of course, that's gonna sound harsh to some of our Protestant listeners, Please explain that. Well, let me say first, Kevin, remember that I used to teach this dogma myself as a Presbyterian, uh, and I was a licensed pastor, uh, a licensed minister uh, in the Presbyterian Church. And I taught this, and I was deeply convinced of it. I have since bitterly repented of it. But it's very understandable why the Protestant Reformers fell into this concept. They fell into this concept because they thought to themselves, what are my options? I can believe in tradition or I can believe in the Bible. It's obvious that the Latin tradition has become corrupted, um, and therefore, what am I left with? I'm left with the scriptures. I should say, just off the cuff also, that sola scriptura was understood different ways by different Protestant reformers. Yes. Luther understood it one way, <clears throat> Zwingli understood it another way, the radical Anabaptists understood it another way, and the Church of England reformers understood it yet another way. And the, the, the measure of differences have to do with how the scripture is dealt with in relationship to sacred community and tradition and the church. Uh, 
Luther was very much more conservative, uh, not from an Orthodox perspective, but within the schema of Protestant reformers. He was on the conservative end and was criticized by people like Zwingli, who thought that Luther didn't take the principle of sola scriptura far enough. Um, so within the Protestant Reformation, there was a lot of controversy on exactly how sola scriptura would work out. From an Orthodox perspective, uh, this is in fact the mother of the Protestant heresy. And you're right to say that I point this out in my book. It's not me saying it. This has been the first principle of Orthodox witness to the Protestant reformers from the 16th century. Um, we, we pointed out from the very beginning that if we, you do not respect the tradition of the church, if you make the mistake that Luther made, which was to jump from a recognition of the errors of post-schism Latin councils to a criticism of ecumenical councils, as soon as you make that move, that unsubstantiated false move, which Luther and all the reformers agreed on, that all general councils had erred, as soon as they did that, they made them popes of the church. That was not the consciousness in the mind of the church for a thousand years. They made years. themselves popes of the church. Absolutely. They became judges of ecumenical councils. And if they're judges of ecumenical councils, who is going to judge them? Right. Uh, now, they would say, no, we're judging the ecumenical councils by the scriptures, but they didn't agree on what those scriptures taught themselves. So, unfortunately, as soon as you break that accountability, I, I like to think of it this way. If Martin Luther was living at the time of the apostles, and the first council of the church took place, which was the council that met in Jerusalem as recorded in Acts chapter 15, this was a council, like all councils, that was convoked in response to the uh, appearance of a heresy. This heresy was the Judaizing heresy. Uh, Jews who had become Christians were following St. Paul around, trying to convince his Gentile converts that they had to accept Jewish customs. They had to be circumcised. They had to keep the fasts of the Jews, etc. The church convoked the council uh, in Acts chapter 15. They made a decision, and then they issued a statement together that began with these words. It has seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to decide this. And then they made a statement saying that the Judaizers were wrong, Gentiles do not have to become Jews, and they made four simple requests of Gentile converts. And then they sent apostles to carry that statement throughout the entire church to ensure that it was obeyed. What would Martin Luther have done then? If all general councils err, would it have been legitimate for Martin Luther to stand up, let's say he was living in Athens, and he said, no, I'm sorry, I disagree with the apostles. They're in, in contradiction to the scriptures. Mm. The apostles would have said, you don't have that right because you're misunderstanding our counsel. Didn't you hear us? It has seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to decide this. The faith of the church is that corporately, when the church needs to, she can come together and be confident that her decisions are guided by the Holy Spirit and that the gates of hell will not prevail. Martin Luther doesn't have that conviction. Mm. As a follow-up to that, Father Josiah, how do Orthodox regard the authority of Scripture in relationship to apostolic big T tradition as opposed to some small t traditions? And please define the latter, apostolic tradition. That is a very large question, actually multiple questions. Yes. Uh, I think a great definition of tradition uh, is the tra tradition of the church is the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. This is our life. It is the eternal life in the kingdom that our Savior bequeathed to us that constitutes the church itself. It's very raison d'etre. Tradition for us is the ultimate authority. So the large umbrella that we would obey is apostolic tradition. This is mentioned constantly throughout the New Testament. This is the faith once delivered to the saints. This is the holy tradition that the apostles passed on to the churches and expected to be obeyed. Both oral and written. St. Paul was very clear. St. Paul was very clear. He wrote to his spiritual children uh, in the city of Thessaloniki, to whom he wrote multiple letters, but we have two in the, in the New Testament, First and Second Thessalonians. He wrote to them that it was necessary for them to stand firm and hold to the traditions that they had received from him. So here's the umbrella. The big umbrella is the apostolic tradition. And then he said, whether by letter or by mouth. It came, apostolic tradition, which is the ultimate authority, came to the church through letters and through mouth. And that can be seen in the life of the Thessalonians themselves. Paul lived with them. 
for a year and a half, I believe, in the Acts of the Apostles. He taught them day in and day out for 18 months. Can you imagine having as your pastor, the great apostle, and sitting with St. Paul and having him teach you day in and day out? Think of the education, the formation, the spiritual guidance you would have received from the apostle. He left you two small letters, one with five chapters, one with three. Most of what you would have received from St. Paul would have been oral. Imagine that after that time, he had to go away on his apostolic ministries, his missionary trips. Then he was martyred in Rome. The Protestants would like us to think that the moment St. Paul died, when Nero put him to death and cut his head off, all of a sudden, the only apostolic teaching that remains binding are these two little letters. I mean, spoken that way, it's just preposterous. It's absolutely mm. ridiculous. If you were living in the Church of the Thessalonians, and you had been, been formed by St. Paul, and he had taught you many other things like how to pray, how to face east, how to make the sign of the cross, that baptism was by triple immersion and immersion. He taught all of those things according to the Holy Fathers and many more. You knew these from his own lips. The idea that only what he wrote would be the ultimate authority uh, would have been a preposterous idea, and it is a preposterous idea from the, from the perspective of the Orthodox mm. Church. Father, would you go so far as to say then that not everything that is necessary for salvation is in the written scriptures? Of course. Of course. What's necessary for salvation is the church. The church is the body of Christ. The church is his divine human presence on the earth. And the church is the conveyor of the life of heaven to men. The church has as her heart and as her great gift to her children the very words of God, to possess the oracles of God in St. Paul's words, to possess the oracles of God. This is our, our great dignity. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous gift to us, and we rely upon the scriptures, absolutely. But we also rely upon other aspects of apostolic tradition in the church. We rely upon the lives of the saints. We rely upon the holy liturgy. We rely upon the sacred canons. We rely upon sacred art. We rely upon iconography. Uh, these are all the writings of the fathers that we can go on and on. These are all means by which God communicates his life to us. And they are in harmony. With scripture. And with each other. Yes. You know, the doctrine of justification by faith alone is taught by Martin Luther and refined by Philip Melanchthon and adopted by all the subsequent reformers is considered by most that I've read. You're, you're more knowledgeable than I, so correct me if I'm wrong. You know, the linchpin theology of the Reformation. St. John Chrysostom, the most influential commentator of the Pauline epistles in the patristic era, wrote extensively about justification long before Luther and Melanchthon, and you have a PhD in work on uh, St. John Chrysostom. So could you briefly describe what justification by faith alone means and how does patristic teaching on justification differ from that of the Reformers and Protestants? Mm. This could be a show of its own. But, it should be. <laughs> but nonetheless. Sola fide is one of the great Reformation slogans. Uh, and in fact, this dogma of the Protestant faith, articulated by Martin Luther from his own experience, really from his own inner angst, uh, has become the hallmark. Although I should say at the outset that there is controversy uh, amongst the Protestants themselves about exactly what this is, very much like there were different opinions of what <coughs> Sola Scriptura is. So for instance, Martin Luther uh, had a concept, what he called the glorious exchange, which lies behind his concept of justification by faith alone, that made his colleague uh, and his great friend, Philip Melanchthon, very nervous. So nervous, in fact, that um, Melanchthon refused to put the word alone in the Augsburg Confession. In its paragraph about justification by faith, hmm. Luther wanted the word alone in there. Hmm. Luther had imposed the word into his German translation of the yes. Bible, which did not exist, yes. which was just the original uh, spring from a fountain of mistranslations that continue to this day in the Protestant movement. Uh, and we could even go back beyond uh, Martin Luther. We could go back to John Wycliffe, for instance, and then later, later uh, into William Tyndale, who made very conscientious uh, mistranslations of the New Testament in order to further Protestant ideology. And this is going on today, for instance, with the New International Version, which is a, a very much not a translation, uh, very much an interpretation in order mm. to promote evangelicalism. Um, 
if listeners want to know more about that, there are footnotes in my book documenting this reality. So even between Luther and his close friend Melanchthon, there was tension about justification by faith alone. Hmm. Melanchthon did not want the word alone in there, and that is something that the Orthodox support because the word alone does not exist uh, in the New Testament. It exists only as the consequence of Martin Luther's specific concept of justification. I would also say that Luther was so uncomfortable with uh, any other concepts of justification that he wanted to remove the epistle of James from the New Testament. In fact, he called the epistle of James an epistle of straw, which scandalized many other of his followers, including Melanchthon, and Melanchthon convinced him to drop this. Let's not revise the canon Hmm. of the New Testament, please. And of course, the reason he wanted to do that is that St. James is so explicit in chapter 2 that justification is not by faith alone. In fact, that's a quote. Abraham was not justified by faith alone. This is James chapter 2. And he goes further and says that he was justified by his works. So an Orthodox would simply say that if any Christian tradition forms a dogma of justification that, is un, that, that makes it so uncomfortable with the actual words of the apostles themselves, so uncomfortable that they want to eradicate them, something is wrong. Hmm. Something is wrong. We believe in justification by faith, but we do not believe in justification by faith alone. We believe in justification of faith working in St. Paul's language through love, which is the emphasis of St. James. St. James says justification by faith alone is a mental game, that even Satan has possession of this mental proposition. Satan knows that God is one, but that is not a faith that he leans on. He he isn't a person trusting in God and letting fruits come from that union. In fact, it's a a dogma that Satan hates. Hmm. Father, in Protestantism, there appears to be somewhat based on what we've been discussing, you know, a gulf between faith and works. Specifically, though, as it relates to salvation itself. Mm. But Protestants, as we know, do good works all over the world, have done great works all over the world for many, many years. Thank God. And they also acknowledge sanctification, which seems to include good works. How does the Protestant teaching of sanctification differ from the Orthodox understanding of salvation as theosis? Tremendous question. Let me respond to your initial affirmation, Uh, first by acknowledging that I agree with you, that there are many, many beautiful charities and acts of Christian compassion that are Protestant born and led. It's absolutely true. However, the Protestant teaching, one of the fruits of of their new soteriology, their 16th century and following soteriology, is to put an emphasis upon salvation um, in the past. You know, the word save in the New Testament is sozo. This is the most common word. And it's used by the writers of the New Testament in all three tenses. It's used in the past tense. It's used in the present tense. It's used in the future tense. If you asked a a Protestant which of those three tenses they thought should be the emphasis or what is, in fact, the emphasis of the New Testament, they would invariably say the past. Their focus is to make sure that people are saved. And when they meet an Orthodox or they meet a Catholic, I can't tell you how many times, even as a priest, I have met a Protestant or an Evangelical, and they have inquired, sometimes discreetly, sometimes not, if I am saved. This is their emphasis. In fact, that emphasis on salvation as a past act, as a a born-again experience, as a time when a person asks Jesus into their life, that emphasis upon save salvation in the past is not the emphasis of the New Testament. If you had three columns and you lifted all the references of past, present, and future, you would see the New Testament emphasis, believe it or not, is on the future. Salvation is primarily a future reality. For an Orthodox, it has a past reality. It, it is uh, given as a gift, as a free gift in response to faith and repentance in the sacrament of baptism where a person is born again, then it is worked out, as St. Paul says, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Forgive me, but there is no trembling in the Protestant concept of salvation. 
We work out our salvation with fear and trembling presently, and we look forward to the day when our Lord Jesus Christ will come back in glory and definitively and finally deliver us from our enemies and bring us into his eternal kingdom. That is our future salvation. And for an Orthodox, we're not saved until you're saved. So we could say, yes, I'm saved, and if we mean I've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and united to Christ in baptism, or I am working out my salvation in a life of faith now. But for us, mostly, we have our emphasis, like the New Testament, upon the future, and we're looking to be saved in the future. Mm -hmm. That concept guts, unfortunately, undercuts the, the motivation uh, in Protestantism for sanctification. So even though sanctification is formally in the systematic theologies of Protestantism, it is not the emphasis of the Protestant Church, which is why the spiritual disciplines are almost non-existent in the Protestant tradition. It's why they don't have a philokalia. It's why they don't have a tradition of saints like we do. Uh, and sadly, it also means that their expectations for what can be done uh, in the Christian life and for the transformation that can take place in a person's life uh, are low. Mm. And when they read or when they, when they touch an Orthodox saint, when someone would read the life of St. John of San Francisco, who, who lived in our times, or St. Nectarios, these are 20th century saints, they would just be left dumbfounded and either deeply motivated to find out how this could happen or convinced that this was all a fraud. Mm. Uh, because it's not in the Protestant experience. Uh, I remember as a Protestant, the greatest, when I became Orthodox, uh, the greatest shock was to move from a tradition that focused upon dogmatic teachings and ideas to, to moving into the Orthodox tradition which focuses on spiritual life. And to see that the majority of our books were not written, we don't even have systematic theologies, the majority of our books are written about sanctity and about how to live the Christian life. Now. Yes. That was a tremendous shock. Prayer is the emphasis in the Orthodox tradition and was most definitely not the emphasis in Calvinism. Yeah, it's always struck me there's a big movement, as you are very aware of, with Richard Foster in Dallas, uh, Willard. Willard, on spiritual formation. Yes. It seems as if evangelicals especially are becoming more aware of the spiritual formation void that exists in just a kind of an extrinsic sense of justification. Because I wonder, why fast? Yes. If... You're already saved. It's all done. Yes. And well, in fact, I think that very question has been put and answered, which is the reason that almost <clears throat> no evangelicals and Protestants do fast. Uh, I remember being in a meeting several years ago and, uh, uh, with, a, with a collection of pastors in New York, and Pastor Rick Warren uh, of Saddleback Church, uh, who I esteem very highly, was there. And I had read his Purpose Driven Life. Uh, a book very well known. That, very well known book. In fact, it's the most published book in the history of the human race, other than the Bible. Is that true? It's true. And I, I went up to him, you know, he, he divides that book into 40 chapters with uh, spiritual devotions for each day. And I went up to him on a break. I said, Pastor Rick, I said, uh, I really enjoyed your book. I said, but that uh, 40 days of fasting, I said, you stole that from us and you didn't give any credit. And he laughed and he, he embraced me and he said, you know, brother, you're right. I got that from the Desert Fathers. And that, that's how he kind of organized yes. his, his 40 days. So there is no doubt what you're saying. There's a, there is a discovery, at least uh, by some. Uh, but unfortunately, it has not, uh, be, because the structure of Protestantism is what it is, it hasn't it's trickled down and hasn't become normative for the Protestant and evangelical life. This is an area I think that evangelical Orthodox uh, interaction could really benefit um, the evangelical tradition. We can be benefited in a lot of ways also, but this is an area, learning the spiritual disciplines, that could really, really uh, be good for them. I would agree with that. You know, you mentioned papal indulgences, and I, I really want to follow up on that, Father Josiah Trenum. One of the most recognized practices that was the spark, if you will, of the Reformation in Germany and Western Europe was the use and sale of papal indulgences by the Roman Catholic or the Latin Church, that mm -hmm. is, the selling of the absolution of sins. Yet you don't mention in your book or in your footnotes, which are very uh, copious and very educational, just the footnotes that are, uh, that the Eastern Church itself, not the Slavic Church, but the Eastern Church, the four uh, pentarchs in, of the East, also sanctioned and sold what were called patriarchal indulgences, very similar to papal indulgences from the 16th through the 18th centuries and up to the 20th century in Greece. Mm 
So I'm curious why you didn't in reference that largely unknown fact, even among Orthodox, uh, in your book, which tends to be very, very open and transparent. The question uh, that you proposed to me, I, I would dispute just a little bit, Kevin. So first, I don't think that uh, <clears throat> the practice of the Orthodox Church, the infusion of this scholastic Western concept in, of indulgences is as thoroughgoing in the 16th to the 18th century that you're suggesting. I would say this, uh, when the Augsburg Confession was sent to the Ecumenical Patriarch, its paragraph on indulgences was accepted completely by the Ecumenical Patriarch. So this, uh, at the very beginning of the Protestant Reformation, we made our formal, the most formal stamp uh, on the Protestant rejection of indulgences. I remember at the same time, the Catholic Counter-Reformation with the birthing of the Jesuits, was a plan to offset the educational efforts of the Protestants. And the popes sent the Jesuits not just to Protestant areas, but to Orthodox areas. The Jesuits were extremely aggressive, and they did have some success in convincing some of our patriarchs to start using their language. In fact, the confession, for instance, of Peter Mogila. Uh, this is uh, really based on Jesuit template. It was the most westernized creed that was ever written in the Orthodox Church. We're generally, or confession, I should say, we're generally not a confession writing church. But in this period, some confessions were made. And so I would say that the, the appearance of uh, indulgences was a, an aberration uh, that went against the, the most formal initial statements of our patriarchs in support of the Protestant Reformation. They were the influence of the Jesuits. They phased out very quickly. They were not consistently upheld, and when they were being issued, they were being criticized by many other patriarchs mm. at the same time. So it does exist, and it's one of the sad uh, expressions of Westernization uh, and illegitimate Westernization in Orthodoxy, which is still somewhat of a problem. I should mention, too, Father, that the Orthodox ultimately condemned their use at a local council of Constantinople in the latter 18th century um, based on the fact that it was essentially money-based. They didn't actually come out and say indulgences were not the purview of the patriarchs. They, they rejected it because of the use of money as the vehicle as opposed to repentance and penance. You know, Kevin, I should just say one more thing. At the same time, e e even in the most egregious circumstances, an indulgence to an Orthodox is very different from an indulgence to a Catholic. Yes. For us, <clears throat> Because on principle, we don't believe in purgatory, and this was something that was very clearly articulated by St. Mark of Ephesus at the Council of Ferrara Florence in 1438 and 1439. We have four of his homilies extant today uh, against purgatory. This was something that the Orthodox would not go for. So when we, talked, when we were issuing patriarchal indulgences, we weren't issuing them uh, to deliver people from hundreds of years in purgatory. This is true. Uh, this, was, this was a matter of binding and loosing this is true. for that person alive today. And the release from purgatory was the main marketing scheme, if you will, of papal indulgences. Exactly. That's what they really got people to uh, purchase. You know, uh, the reformers <clears throat> made up a kind of a, a jingle, uh, kind of a, a, a little hymn to yes. say, uh, to make fun of the indulgence preachers like Johann Tetzel, right. who really irritated Martin Luther. And they would say, a coin into the coffer jings, and a soul from purgatory springs. springs. And it was just very crass, yes, it sadly. Was marketing, anyway. <laughs> Father, moving along, many of the uh, major reformers like Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon and Lutheranism, John Calvin and, and the Reformed tradition, Thomas Cranmer of the Church of England, the Wesleys and Methodism, quoted pre-Reformation Eastern Christian fathers, as you pointed out. They, they understood that the Greeks existed even before the Latin church did, or, you know, most of the teaching came from the East in the early ecumenical councils. We'll talk a little bit about that. And they quoted people like Chrysostom, Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian. So my question is, how much actual continuity, mm -hmm. theologically and in terms of church polity or doctrine, did the reformers maintain with their patristic forebears? The question of theological continuity of the reformers with the, with the Orthodox faith, uh, once again, is, has to be a answered in, in a multiplicity of ways because different Reformed traditions have right. different levels of, of continuity. The Lutherans, 
when they issued their Book of Concord, I think in 1580, which was a summary of different Lutheran confessions that they thought together could be read as kind of a statement of the Lutheran faith, appended to it a book of theological witnesses in which they had many, many of the great fathers quoted, St. John Chrysostom, the, the Cappadocians, St. John of Damascus, uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria, many uh, witnesses, especially to the areas of their particular concern. However, uh, I would say just in general that their use of the patristic tradition should be described as selective. So for instance, the number one church father universally for the Protestant reformers was St. Augustine of Hippo. And they were able to access his writings because a fantastic, nearly complete edition of Augustine's works was published in 1480. And most of the Protestant reformers had this edition. Luther devoured it. In his own words, he devoured the writings of St. Augustine. However, they selectively used St. Augustine. As a matter of fact, B.B. Warfield, the great 19th century Calvinist Princetonian uh, theologian, said that the Reformation was, in essence, the triumph of Augustine's doctrine of grace over doctrines, Augustine's doctrine of the church. Uh, whether or not you think that's true, What's clear is he himself is saying that the Protestant reformers only took what they wanted. They took the dogmas in Augustine that they thought would support them. Uh, they did the same with St. Cyprian. John Calvin quoted Cyprian quite a lot uh, in his institutes. So I would simply say that in general the Greek tradition was not very accessible to them. Hmm. And the Latin tradition they quoted selectively. Um, that's better than not wanting to quote them at all. Uh, and there were some branches of the Radical Reformation that weren't interested in the witness of the fathers at all. Zwingli was the most arrogant of all the Protestant reformers and essentially said when he defended his own new teachings in what were called the, his 67 theses, which were theses that he, were collected from his sermons, um, he said in his writings that the gospel had not been taught with such clarity from the time of the last apostle until him. And this, this idea, which creates what I call the Protestant parenthesis theory, the idea that the truth somehow disappeared when the last apostle died and was reignited uh, through the witness of uh, this or that apostle, this has provided the paradigm for every type of schismatic sect that has grown in the West, and especially in America. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, ooh, 1844, Charles Mormonism. Smith wrestled. Mormonism, all of a sudden, uh, Joseph Smith has, has restored, you know, the church was apostate and now it's been restored. Hmm. Uh, this, of course, is more egregious than what the Protestant reformers did. They kept more continuity than either of those groups did. But still, the principle is the same. They can't, for us, we follow the witness of the church as articulated by St. Vincent of Larins. He says in his Comunitorium, he said that the way that you can know if your faith is the Orthodox faith, it's not by quoting scriptures. Every heretic does that. It's by showing that what you believe has been believed by all people in all places at all times since the time of Christ. That's how you know hmm. the tests of antiquity and geography. That's how you know, in fact, your faith is the faith once given to the saints. Hmm. Father, you know, there are many Orthodox I've heard who have said that the Reformation was in many ways a reinterpretation of the Christian faith. And they connect this idea with the idea of the development of doctrine. The doctrine wasn't set and infallibly set by the apostles and the apostolic tradition, but a needs to continue to develop, led by the Holy Spirit, as they would argue. Um, and there's been so much of this in the West. How do Orthodox view this idea of the development of doctrine? Mm. Differently. For us, the faith, as I mentioned, was something that Christ gave to us. And the articulations, the dogmatic articulations of the faith over time have primarily been issues of clarification in response to heresy. So we don't, we, each ecumenical council, we don't believe, is establishing something new. Right. Now the Catholics, who have a much more robust, uh, positively speaking, concept of the development of doctrine, which they've had to kind of create to justify the creation of new dogmas that the ancient church didn't recognize, like the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary, uh, like the infallibility of the Pope, etc. They try to make an argument that what development of doctrine is, is a seed growing into a tree. So they, they try to maintain continuity. They have a far greater emphasis on that than the Protestants do themselves, who are much more content simply to say this is what the Scripture says. Uh, and maybe there were whole periods of darkness uh, in which 
the church was erring. They're much more content to say that. However, from an orthodox perspective, our concept of originality, what we think of when we, when we think about the faith originally given, we think that originality for us today is being faithful to the originals. We don't think originality is coming up with something new, like you have to do when you go do a PhD in a Western university. You have to come up with a, dog, a, a dissertation on some subject no one has ever discussed, which fuels innovation in theology, especially in the area, in the area of theology. So an Orthodox would be much, <clears throat> un, very much uncomfortable with the idea that you could end up articulating a dogma that previous generations would not recognize as their own faith. Hmm. You point out in your book, Father Josiah, Rock and Sand, that from the beginning there was, and we've discussed some of this, that there was a wide spectrum of difference within the Protestant Reformation. And you made a distinction within the Reform movement that I actually find useful between those you call the Protestant magisterial reformers and those you describe as radical reformers. And some of the earlier reformers apparently were closer to the apostolic tradition, as you pointed out. Can you explain in general terms, and I'd like to talk briefly about some of the specific areas where the magisterials and the radicals may have diverged, but can you tell us in general what the differences might be between these two camps within the Reformation and maybe name some of their leaders? Absolutely. When Luther invented a new concept of authority, and rejected the traditional loci of authority with bishops, councils, dogmatic decrees, and canons. When he rejected those, and he invented the concept of sola scriptura, he uh, took the top off of the bottle, uh, and he uncorked that bottle, and he couldn't get the genie back in. And so from that moment on, some of his followers, very quickly, like within five years, uh, of his breaking with Rome, which I think took place in 1524. Within five years, some of his closest friends and disciples began to criticize him on the same principles that he was using to criticize the papacy. Hmm. That he wasn't being thoroughgoing enough in his reformation, that he was too conservative, he was accepting too much. And, and they became reformers of the reformer. Hmm. And that ha process continued and continued and continued. Some of the main areas were this, the mass. Martin Luther kept the basic structure of the Mass. Uh, he altered the language of the canon such that it wouldn't be viewed as a sacrifice. Um, the church structure he kept, for instance, in his small catechism, he required a yearly auricular confession, that is, a confession in the, in the precincts of the church to a priest. Uh, he taught the, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Uh, he kept sacred art. This upset many of the Reformers. Um, he, he thought that art, using orthodox language, he thought art was sermon for the eyes. As we do. As we do, in fact. And so immediately some of his own, his own followers began to criticize him uh, for holding on to too much. Now, it went, it went so far, not just to fuel uh, the movement of the Anabaptists who rejected iconography, rejected statuary, rejected Christian art. They also rejected the baptism of infants, which they said was the first and chief heresy of the Pope. As well as the real presence of Christ in the in Zwingli, communion. Zwingli and Luther almost went to war over the central worship rite of the Christian church, which is the Eucharist. Now this, this should be the real eye-opener for people who are in the tradition of Sola Scriptura. If the scriptures are clear, you would think that those who are the great teachers of the scripture, like the Protestant reformers, would be able to agree on the, what the significance of the central act of Christian worship is, the Eucharist. Yet none of them could. The Lutherans had their definition. The Zwinglians and the Anabaptists had their definition of what the Eucharist. The Calvinists had their definition of what is the Eucharist. And they all thought that their expressions, their dogmatic statements on that point, were the clear teaching of scripture. And in fact, they almost went to war. The princes that were supporting them, remember that Protestantism is nothing without political supporters. This is very much a political movement. We, we're talking about it in the realm of theology. Right. That's only one perspective to understand the Protestant Reformation. And in my opinion, it's not even the great reason to understand the Protestant Reformation, which is very much uh, a land grab and a pushback against the temporal authority of the Pope by nationalist princes who wanted authority and found in the Protestant reformers a means to push back against the Pope hmm. and to seize monasteries and to seize money and to end papal taxation. Uh, that's for another discussion, no doubt. Hmm. But they almost the princes supporting these reformers almost went to battle 
over the differences, the unresolved differences of the major Protestant reforms about what the Eucharist itself is. Mm. Um, so who would you consider in the denominations that we know of today in contemporary Christendom, who would you consider the magisterials and whom would you consider the radicals? I should just say that that language of magisterial and radical is not my language. This is traditional Western church historiography. Uh, the magisterial ref reformers, Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, Martin Butzer, and many others. Uh, these these uh, were the great movers and shakers, Thomas Cranmer and the Church of England. These were the great movers and shakers uh, of, of the what became the mainline Protestant denominations. People on the radical side followed Zwingli. Zwingli denounced the Anabaptists. He, many thought he secretly believed in their tenet of not baptizing infants, but he thought it would be too upsetting, it would cause civil unrest if he supported that. Um, but most of their tenets came from Zwingli, and then they had many great theologians themselves, people like Hoopmeyer, people like uh, Menno Simons, from whom come the Mennonites, Mennonites. Um, the Amish, etc. Those are on the far side. Why it's so important for us, why that movement, why the Anabaptist movement is so important for Americans, is that the, the reformers were, the magisterial reformers were continental realities. And America was founded by people seeking religious freedom from continentally reformed churches. They wanted to come to this country in order to have religious freedom, to be dissenters, and many of them held um, uh, less than traditionally Protestant dogmas. They, they weren't traditional Lutherans, they weren't traditional Church of England people. They were traditionally Calvinistic reform, although some of them were. You're talking Puritans and the Huguenots and those. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The Huguenots were the French Protestants, especially who, who descended from Calvin, who was a Frenchman, even though he didn't spend much of his time there. Um, but this country has deep, deep Anabaptist roots, and the, the great influential uh, forms of Christianity today are from Anabaptist roots in America. So you would say, and we're going to get to America as we uh, proceed into our second part of this interview, but since we've discussed it now, so you would consider then the history of American Christianity to not, not be of the magisterial reformed tradition, but really more of the Anabaptist and the radical reformed tradition? You know, Kevin, the Puritans that came and, and, and settled in the early colonies were primarily Episcopalian, Presbyterian, and Congregational. And there was a lot of going back and forth. But that should shock an Orthodox, because it shows you that even the Puritans who were Episcopalian priests who came here, people like, eventually, 200 years later, like George Whitfield and John Wesley, who were ministers of the Church of England, they, uh, they did not view having a bishop and having the liturgical forms and sacraments like an Orthodox would. An Orthodox would never say, oh, you can have a bishop or leave him. For us, we know from the fathers that where the bishop is, the church is. No bishop, no church. And yet the Puritans, many of them, left the Church of England without a second thought and even moved into Presbyterianism and then into Congregationalism. A good example is Jonathan Edwards, who many consider to be the last Puritan in America. He lived from 1703 to 1758. He started out as a Presbyterian minister, and he moved to a congregational church. And this is a radical change in church polity, but it shows to you that really polity, ecclesiology, this is the ultimate Achilles heel of the Protestant movement. There was no unanimity amongst the Protestant reformers about exactly what the church is. They knew what it wasn't. It wasn't Rome. But they couldn't provide an alternative that was consistent. And therefore, it became, to this day, in the Protestant movement, forms the form of the church, church governance, the sacraments, these things are viewed very much uh, as adiaphora, not important, not mm. necessary. I want to focus on a couple of things, Father, as a follow-up to that. Let's talk a little bit about uh, traditional church hierarchy because it's mm. in Scripture, presbyters, deacons, and, and bishops. What do you say in response to the claim of some Protestants that I've heard that the traditional church hierarchy and order of the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox churches uh, do not represent the order or polity of the, quote, early New Testament church, but was rather the creation of the imperial church of Constantine yes. of the 4th century. Yes, this is a very common uh, affirmation by Protestants, especially by American type evangelicals. I remember after I had just become Orthodox, I was teaching a Bible study, and I had uh, some friends in it who were from an evangelical background, and their pastor was interacting with me in writing um, about what I was teaching them, which I thought was very nice. And he wrote me a very extended letter in which he, he 
juxtaposed exactly what you're saying. He says, why are you talking to them about bishops, priests, deacons, dioceses, um, authority, sacraments, when you should be teaching them about the New Testament? This is what he's told me. And I wrote back to him and I said, I'm teaching them about bishops and priests and deacons and sacraments and authority because it's in the New Testament. The New Testament <laughs> teaches about those things. And I asked him, I said, who exactly do you think Timothy and Titus are? Timothy and Titus, here are, here are spiritual sons of St. Paul, whom he expected to be leading churches in Crete and Ephesus, whom he expected to be doing ordinations through the laying on of hands, which he says communicates grace, whom he expected to solicit obedience from the people to whom uh, they, they owed a responsibility. I said, who do you think they are? I said, here, here are very clear examples of bishops. They weren't just presbyters. They were called upon to ordain presbyters in every city, like Paul had done in his own example, as recorded in Acts chapter 14. They were required to make presbyters and to make deacons, but they themselves were higher. They weren't of the 12 apostles, but they were higher than priests and deacons. Here's a, a clear example of bishops, presbyters, and deacons that all Christians were responsible to have. Hmm. And in fact, if you didn't have them, as we see in the Acts of the Apostles, if you were not yet connected to the apostles and their authority, you had to be. Hmm. And the apostles went and would lay their hands upon you and bring them into, the, into your flock. So the idea of independency, hmm. the idea that somehow the church is um, not a living, organic, physical organism, which is very much at the heart of the evangelical movement, is not a New Testament teaching. You can search, Kevin, the New Testament until you're blue in the face, looking for a single image of the church that isn't tangible and concrete. Mm. The idea, as has been invented, especially in the evangelical movement, that the church is invisible, we think that that is a wonderful description of the evangelical teaching on the church, that it's an invisible church because it doesn't exist. And if something doesn't exist, it is invisible, in fact. But every image in the New Testament about the church, a tree, a temple, a body, a building, a vineyard. Have you ever seen invisible trees, bodies, temples, and no, vineyards? They're, they're material. They exist in, in space and time. They're real. Yeah. They're real. And when it's real, then you put you take structure seriously. When you think it's invisible, you can discard structure. We also, too, Father, uh, have, don't we, um, writings that predate uh, the Imperial Church of St. Constantine that speak about traditional church structure from St. Ignatius of Antioch. In what this the uh, first century? No, you're, you're referencing very wisely the apostolic fathers. Uh, these are the spiritual sons of the twelve apostles themselves. Exactly. If you want to know what kind of church Jesus left the apostles, then you should look what kind of churches the apostles built. Exactly. Uh, you can actually go to many of the places where the apostles were uh, in your New Testament. You can still go to Corinth. You can still go to the Thessaloniki, and you can find the descendants of the apostles uh, and their spiritual children there, and you can see what they look like. St. Ignatius taught a very clear structure of bishops, priests, and deacons in the church, and he died maybe in 107. Polycarp. We have clear teaching from St. Hippolytus. We have teaching from Tertullian, from St. Cyprian. These are all wonderful saints, profound theologians of both the Greek and Latin tradition long before Emperor Constantine came on the scene. Yeah, I think that's important to raise. Let's talk a bit about liturgical form. You mentioned that some were more conservative and some others. You know, in contemporary Protestant Christianity, there's much emphasis on spontaneity of prayer and worship. Mm -hmm. That is not structured liturgical form, as you point out in your book, and spontaneous prayers. Uh, there's a lot of prejudice against oh, sure. written prayers by evangelicals. Was this a tenet of the magisterial reformers? Great question. You make me think about an interaction that I had many years ago uh, with a Reformed pastor. It was an accidental uh, interaction because I was, I was catechizing a young woman who had been raised Reformed and was becoming Orthodox. And she was communicating her process with her former pastor in the Reformed tradition. And he was very upset that she would become an Orthodox Christian. And I was uh, wondering what his concerns were. And he sent her a letter. And in the letter, he, he had Xeroxed the sermon by the great 19th century Baptist preacher of London, Charles Spurgeon, in which Spurgeon said that prayer must always be extemporaneous and that to pray with pre-written words was to quench the spirit. 
I mean, but many evangelicals believe that today. Absolutely. Many do. Many do. This is a tremendous irony, since should anyone have said that at the time of the Protestant Reformation in Martin Luther's congregation or John Calvin's congregation, they would have been corrected immediately. The Reformers wrote out their liturgies. They all had liturgies, that's number one. They were all written. John Calvin did not permit a single prayer to be made extemporaneously. Really? Absolutely not. And I think the best way to understand their mind is that this is an expression of dependence upon the tradition. They recognized how serious it is to talk to God in his house. You don't just walk into God's house and use the resources alone of your own mind and heart because that is a very limited pool. C.S. Lewis says it very beautifully in one of his articles. Um, I, I believe it was in God in the Dock, although I'm not positive. He said that the reason the church has always used written prayers, prayers composed by deified men and women who were close to God, his friends, and knew how to approach him and how to speak to him. This is one of the reasons that we use those prayers. He says, the reason the church has always used written prayers is because if you don't, if a pastor prays extemporaneously, he's asking his congregation to do three things at the same time that are impossible to do. The first is to listen super carefully so that you get the words because you don't know what's coming. The second is to theologically evaluate what's being said to see if it's correct. And the third is to say the Amen. If you don't say the Amen, the prayer is not your prayer. If you do say the Amen, everything that was said in the prayer is now yours. It's the hook that connects you to the prayer. He goes, and a person can't do those three things at the same time. Hmm. Interesting. Talk a little bit about the sacraments um, and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. I know that in your book you quoted Zwingli as referring to sacraments as bare signs and empty symbols. But obviously, since we've got this demarcation between the magisterials and the radicals, not all of them felt that way. So how did the magisterials define baptism and Holy Communion, and how did the uh, radicals define baptism and Holy Communion? It's a wonderful question about the sacraments. We've talked a little bit about the differentiation on the Eucharist, um, and we, we noted simply that each of the major traditions, the Lutheran, the Reformed and the Anabaptist all had different dogmas about yes. this. And I should point out, additionally, since that time, the, art, the, art, the opinions of the Protestant Reformers themselves have not been maintained by their own spiritual children. So today, Martin Luther might very well not recognize Lutheran churches as having anything to do with him whatsoever. He was having that problem even during his own lifetime. Yeah. Many, many Reformed churches today have no appreciation for the Eucharist receive the Eucharist very, very, or what they think at least of the Eucharist, very, very rarely, uh, often in the evening and maybe only quarterly. Whereas John Calvin taught that receiving Holy Communion every Sunday was of great import. Now, ironically, he actually never got that done uh, because he ultimately was accountable to politicians who didn't want that to happen mm. and thought it was too papal. Um, so that's just to point out that not only was there a major difference re differences regards to the Eucharist, amongst the reformers themselves, but their successors to this day for the last 500 years have also altered their teachings very, very much so. Mm. Luther's concept of the Eucharist was never formally accepted by his Lutheran followers. Really? No. no. And John Calvin called the presence of Christ in the Eucharist a spiritual presence. Yes. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you think that means. I doubt that. <laughs> because I'm not sure that John Calvin knows what that means, hmm. nor any of his followers have ever known what that means. Okay. He was trying to, to uh, navigate between the Lutheran position, which he thought was too Catholic, ah. um, even though Martin Luther affirmed that the real presence of Christ was not technically in the elements. He thought right. that to say that you're eating the body and blood of Jesus literally was going too far. And at the same time, he had the Zwinglians on the other side who he ah. thought were nuts. And just to tell you how intense this debate was, Martin Luther was known to have said, that he would have rather drunk raw blood with the Pope than shared mere wine, that is untransubstantiated wine, with the fanatics. And imagine what he would have said about those who used grape juice. Interesting. And that's a shocker when you think, it if, if you're an evangelical today and you think Martin Luther is the founder of your movement and he's, is a great hero for you, to be disowned by him uh, it has to be a pretty pretty shocking reality. On the subject of baptism, we have great differences as well. Martin Luther remained extremely 
focused and, and committed to baptismal regeneration. The Reformed tradition less, less so, although an argument could be made for that, although many today in the Reformed tradition do not believe in baptismal re, uh, uh, regeneration. And the Anabaptists absolutely do not believe that anything uh, on the inside takes place in baptism. Baptism for them is merely an external sign of something that has invisibly taken place previously. Hmm. Interesting, too, that you point out that there is really such a, a gulf between what the early magisterial reformers believed and what we believe in this country today as evangelicals, one of which is the ever-virginity of the Mother of mm. God, whom all, including Zwingli, which blew my mind, and you point this out in your book, believed in her ever-virginity. I would think if you were on the street corner and asked 10 evangelicals, maybe even mainstream Protestants, if the, the mother of God remained ever virgin, they would say, of course not. Yes, they would think that that's Mariolatry uh, coming out. But you're right, the Protestant reformers shared a, uh, the tradition of the church uh, with regards to the virgin and her uniqueness. Uh, they shared that even the most radical ones. So, Father, um, continuing this discussion about the sacraments and other practices of the early church and the way some of these practices changed. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I would, I, I'm going to use a tough word, antipathy towards the use of and the understanding of icons and iconography among modern evangelicals, in particular, maybe some mainstream Protestants. I'm not as familiar with them. Was that the case with the magisterials? You've hmm. spoken a little bit about that, and, and, and what, what would you say to that? Once again, there was not a unified witness on uh, what the Protestant opinion of sacred art would be. And Martin Luther maintained the interior of his churches uh, fairly untouched. Zwingli, while he was preaching, um, had his followers remove everything in the church and destroy it on the principle that statues were idols. John Knox in Scotland literally was preaching in the Cathedral of St. Andrew and uh, of which there are remains to this day, right on the beautiful North Sea there. And while he was preaching, the destruction of that magnificent uh, cathedral, including uh, the relics of St. Andrew, the first called apostle, uh, were completely destroyed. Really? So that by the time he was done preaching, the building itself was destroyed. So there is a, a wide divergence. In, in, the ref in much of the Reform movement, there is a great an antipathy towards depictions of Jesus Christ. This is especially true in the Presbyterian tradition. For instance, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, in the longer catechism that the Westminster divines produced, in their commentary on the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven images to worship them, they explicitly say that to make any depiction of Jesus Christ is a violent, violation of the second commandment and is idolatry. Now, we Orthodox... Uh, know what that is. That is the reappearance of a much older heresy called iconoclasm that tormented the church for 150 years, from about 700 until 843 or so. Um, and we would simply point out to those Reformed Protestants who believe that you should not depict Jesus Christ, uh, we would just point out this. To depict Jesus Christ is not to depict the divine nature. Therefore, there are accusations that we are depicting God uh, of our own creation are false. We are simply bearing witness to how God depicted himself. The Son of God, co-eternal with the Father, in time became a man, assumed human flesh, became a human being, and remains a human being. Therefore, for the church to make pictures of Jesus Christ is not just possible. It's necessary as a promotion of the gospel and to bear witness to the greatest miracle in the history of the world, which is that God became a man and remains a man. And remains a man. So the witness uh, of iconography is to the gospel itself, and we find it tragic that uh, people would oppose the depiction of Jesus Christ. Now, most evangelicals today would not uh, oppose on principle making pictures of Jesus, but they would not because of the ahistorical nature of the movement and their disconnect from tradition, they, they would not think that depictions of Jesus have any authenticity to them. Whereas an Orthodox, uh, well, when an Orthodox looks at an icon of Jesus Christ, we believe that we're looking at Jesus Christ. Yes. You know, I don't know if this, is, if, if, if this has true historical uh, 
verity or not, but I've heard some classic uh, Byzantine historians say that one of the reasons the first emperor uh, opposed icons was because he started to believe what the Muslims were saying, that it was because of the heresy of what they called idolatry, that they were losing, that the Byzantines were losing their wars against the, the uh, Persian Muslims. And therefore, I don't know if, if that's true or not, but from what I have taken from this that... Is a, this is a very commonly held position, of course. It's a historical position. It's something that is assumed that can't necessarily be proven. But Leo had lost almost half of his territory. Well, he actually Muslims. preached about that and mentioned the fact that we're losing these battles because of Absolutely. idolatry. So that's, that's, that exists in history, Absolutely. some of those early sermons. And of course, Muslims do not believe in the great miracle of incarnation. They do not believe God has a son. When they took over Jerusalem and they built the Dome of the Rock, they, they etched in the stone facing Christian Jerusalem, overlooking all of our churches, God has no son. So, of course, they would oppose what we do. Yeah. And to, to think that iconoclasm could have been influenced by that should be somewhat of a uh, shock to those that oppose the idea of I icons. Talking, uh, as we start to wind down, Father, on this first segment, I would like to ask you about how the magisterials and the radicals of the Reformation understood the saints. Mm. And... Uh, not only that there were pious men that lived, but we ask for the intercession of the saints, the mother of God and, and the various saints, because we don't believe they're, quote, dead and yes. no longer in existence. We have reference to this in the gospel and the parable of Lazarus, the rich man who retained his sense of who he was and his family and so on and so forth. How did the magisterials understand and the radicals understand saints and why is that not a factor in today's mm. uh, Protestant and evangelical world? Great question. Universally, the Protestant reformers resisted prayer for the departed. Uh, there are a few witnesses to it in the Anglican tradition, which is the least radical uh, of the Reformed traditions. But we could say, universally, the Protestant reformers ceased to pray for the dead when they became Protestant. And this was very much associated with their universal rejection of purgatory. For them, praying for the dead would imply that a person is in pur purgatory. Oh, really? And, and Orthodox would simply respond and say, praying for the departed is a universal Christian custom. We have witness to this from the earliest days of the church. In fact, it's even a Jewish custom, as borne witness, for instance, in the Maccabean history, in Second Maccabees, uh, when Judas Maccabeus lost many of his soldiers in a battle uh, against the Greek pagans who were trying to impose Greek idolatry upon the Jews. As he was uh, collecting his dead on the field of battle, he found that those who had died, in fact, had idolatrous medals under their shirt. And he recognized that they, the reason that they were killed was because they had been unfaithful to God and God allowed them not to be protected by his divine grace. And he asked the high priest, the Jewish high priest, uh, to make prayer, and he offered sacrifice for the souls of his departed soldiers. So this, this was a part of Jewish tradition. This is how Jews prayed. This is important because this is how Jesus prayed as a Jewish man in synagogue and in the rites of uh, the Jewish religion. So if you think that praying for the departed is terrible, you have a problem, unfortunately, with the Lord Jesus Christ and his own practice. Hmm. Uh, if you read John chapter 10, John chapter 10 has uh, an, is an account of Jesus participating in Hanukkah celebrations. This is also very difficult for Protestants to grasp because one of, the, one of the tenets of the Protestant movement was that nothing should be done in worship without explicit warrant of Scripture. Of course, this falls from sola scriptura. If the Scriptures, you have to base your life on the Scriptures alone, and worship is such an important part of life, you shouldn't do anything that the Scriptures don't tell you to do in worship. The problem with that is that's not how Jesus lived. Hanukkah is nowhere authorized as a service for the Jews. And yet Jesus was participating in the festival of Hanukkah, during which there were prayers for the departed. So praying for the departed is universal Christian tradition. It was universally rejected, very much because they thought it had to do with purgatory. We Orthodox don't believe in purgatory, but we pray for the departed because we don't believe 
that uh, death is simple. The idea, as found in the Westminster Confession of Faith, that the moment you die, instantaneously you're in heaven or paradise if you're a Christian. We can't find that in any of the pages of the New Testament. For us, the process of death is uh, a process. And the movement of the soul is not something that happens instantaneously, and prayer for that person is very helpful and provides tremendous consolation. And we also don't think it's over until it's over, and this has to do with what we mentioned earlier about salvation. Ultimately, final salvation is on at the great judgment and the return of our Savior, and it is possible, and there are many examples in the history of the Church, of people who are in Hades, being taken out of Hades, and being brought into paradise. And we mm -hmm. pray that that would happen, especially on the day of mm -hmm. Pentecost, we pray that. You mentioned the book of Maccabees, and of course, in most of the Protestant scriptures, those are called deuterocanonical mm -hmm. or apocryphal, and they don't, they're not packaged with the scriptures that sure. they read, so many of them sure. have never even seen or heard of that. Yes, this is another example of the difference between the Protestant reformers and contemporary Protestants or, or their descendants, the evangelicals. Very few evangelicals know are even familiar with what we would call as an orthodox, the longer canon of the Old Testament, uh, because it's simply not in their Bibles. But what is of interest is that it was in the Bibles of all the Protestant reformers. It was. And even of really? the Bibles that they published. Now, they didn't always put them in the same places that the Orthodox right. and the Catholic did. Sometimes they put them between the Testaments. Someday they, sometimes they put them at the end. And because there are teachings in the longer canon that are diametrically opposed to Protestant things, like I just shared with you, praying for the departed, they would often put a qualification in their statements and say, these are read for moral example, but not for the establishment of dogma. Now, that's a failed concept, because if your moral example is praying to saints, you're establishing a dogma. Uh, but the Protestant reformers were very familiar. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther wrote commentaries upon the so-called Apocrypha. He wrote a commentary on Tobit. Really? In the 19th century, when the United Bible Society began to publish their Bible for the first time ever out of Great Britain, Bibles were published without the longer canon, and since then that's become normative, which is tragic. Mm -hmm. uh, now there are many, many Christians in America who simply don't know anything about the Maccabean history, don't know anything about Tobit, about the wisdom of Solomon. Very precious material. Yes. Well, Father, let's end on this note, and we'll uh, continue in this very fascinating conversation in segment two. And uh, my guest, of course, is Father Josiah Trinham. His book is Rock and Sand, an Orthodox Appraisal of the Protestant Reformers and Their Teachings. I highly recommend it. It's published by New Rome Press, and you can purchase it on Amazon.com. And hopefully we'll see you for the second segment. <laughs>